All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you, my fellow millennials, should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Alexander Svetsky. He's an author and entrepreneur who ran numerous ventures in the past 15 years. And together with Mark Moss, he wrote and published the best-selling book on the Communist Manifesto and is now working on the next book called The Bushido of Bitcoin. He also founded the Bitcoin Times in 2018, a limited once a year published magazine covering Bitcoin's current affairs. And he's currently building an, uh, well, multiple open source AI tools with a focus on the spirit of Satoshi, the world's first Bitcoin centric language model. Well, that's a, that's a lot of stuff, man. Welcome. Thanks, man. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I have a disease, which is I can't sit straight. <laughs> I can't sit in one spot. Too many well, things. Isn't that also what Bitcoin makes you do a bit? Like you want to. Like contribute to it yeah you want to i mean bitcoin yes it does it absolutely does incentivize uh wanting to do bigger things with your life and, and i think that's something we've we'll discuss in today's episode but something moderns have lost you know we've sort of been you know psyoped into valuing average instead of excellence and yeah. you know everyone's everyone's you know, taught that uh, it's it's okay, you know, just to be just average and do just enough, right? And yeah. I think I find that a disgusting way to live. I really like like the memes, but it's sad at the same time, like these memes of, it's a specific name for like uh, carving of statues where the statues have like a like a veil, right? Or they're, they're wearing something on their head. Do you know what I mean? Like it's uh, this old like Greek, it's like a certain way of, of um, creating um uh, sculptures as if someone is wearing something over their head like a cloth or something do you know this style no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know it no uh, I'll, I'll send you a picture but like people send these memes like why don't we do this anymore like it, it's just like this crazy amount of time that people spend on a statue right that just lives for a few thousand years and we are still marveling at like how how did they do that i think that that is to your point right that we don't really know how to how to do that anymore or also not really incentivized to take i don't know a year or two just skull, uh, you know creating a sculpture so yeah totally um, yeah. beauty yeah. takes time and we 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 don't want to invest time in anything anymore yeah definitely so we'll dive into that but first i wanted to ask you how did you discover bitcoin and what made you not get it initially ooh um <laughs> I I was a gold bug back in 20 be, between 2008 and 2012 I was a crazy gold bug right I was into gold silver I was buying that stuff I was watching Max Kaiser Doug Casey all these crazy people uh, Mike Maloney etc um, talking about gold and silver because I had um, I had taken my scholarship money I was a I was studying civil engineering I took my scholarship money I put it on the stock market and I lost everything basically um, and I spent all this time trying to figure out how was I so stupid and that's where I sort of found like you know gold sound money as a concept and it was around that time that I first heard about Bitcoin I believe um, you know I don't know I I remember where or how maybe it was Max Kaiser jumping up and down on the couch or something yelling yeah. about Bitcoin but I can remember was, that also yeah, yeah. It, it was something but I, I honestly I never took it seriously I was like yeah whatever sound money right I've got my gold I got my silver that's all I was interested in so my life took me a different direction I was on an entrepreneurial path I was building businesses I got into tech I was you know building startups all sorts of things like that. And it wasn't until 2015 again that um, late 2015, early 2016, that a friend of mine said, "Hey, bro, you know, like, you heard of this Bitcoin thing?" And I was like, "Yeah, I heard about that a while ago. Like, you know, is it still around?" And he's like, "Yeah, bro, you know, my my friend made you know a million dollars overnight from it." But I was like, what the fuck is this guy talking about?" And we, you know, we we <laughs> get into this conversation. I look at I look up Bitcoin and I see it's something like 500 bucks or whatever it was at the time. And I was like, holy crap. Like I remember this being at like dollars or something like, you know, something of those yeah. sort of that, that range. And, you know, that obviously interested me in it. And I started going down the rabbit hole and I've got this sort of meme that I say to people is like, I came for the money, but I stayed for the money. Um, so like when you, when you start to understand like what the money actually entails, there's, there's a bigger, there's a bigger thing at play here. Right. And um, 
and yeah, that like as I started going down that rabbit hole, it was particularly you know 2017 where I really became a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, you know, I realized there was something special, something important, something unique here, and here I am today, writing, building businesses, doing all sorts of stuff in and around Bitcoin. Nice man, yeah, it's interesting that number go up. Obviously, is for a lot of people the thing where they where they get into Bitcoin, but then when you realize that it's actually so much bigger could be so much bigger but already so much bigger than just you as the individual right it's so fascinating also to i don't know how you, how you experience that but for me like sometimes i end up somewhere in just my rational thinking and then i think like no it can it cannot be that big right and then i watch other people talk about their own journey and then they end up in the same place and then i think like okay well maybe there's some merit to it still right so you do need to see that other people you know who you respect or, or or you enjoy their thinking that they end up in the same place just to keep your own well almost ego in check right in yeah, in, a, I mean, in, there, a, in a good way there's, yeah there's either definitely something here or we are the most ridiculously stupid group exactly. of cultists <laughs> exactly. in the history of humanity it's literally one of the two like it's like yes. it's yeah. one of the two extremes there's no middle ground here yeah Hundred percent agree. I once uh, once someone told me, yeah, the CIA made it and this and this and blah blah. I said, well, if the CIA made this and this comes out and it's all bad and all doom and gloom and whatever, then I think I have to live in a cave and like I don't know, like go away. Like I would be honestly like I would have fooled myself. So I fully agree, man. Like it's uh, it's uh, zero or everything, right? Um, yeah, let's talk about the stuff you did, man. Uh, I love the name Uncommunist Manifesto. Thank you. It's a, it's a book with Mark Moss where you argue for a society structured around natural capitalist principles, dynamic inequality. I would love to hear what you what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. And social mobility based on individual merit and competence. That's mm -hmm. something I, I really like. You know, that that's, uh, uh, you know, equality of opportunity, not outcome, right? Um, what inspired you to to write this? Yeah, so the, the, the book came about as a, as a joke initially. So we were, Mark and I were in Salvador, kind of between the Salvador Bitcoin announcement and the implementation. So I think it was like July 2021 or something like that. And he, he just asked me, we were having lunch, and he said, have you read the Communist Manifesto? And I was like, why the, why the fuck would I do that? Uh, and he's like, it's really bad. And I said, I'm sure it is, Mark. I said, why would I want to give myself brain cancer by reading this? And he's like, you know, he goes, did you realize it was like the, the one of the most uh, widely read socio or sort of political economics books um, uh, in history? And I was like, damn, bro. I was like, that explains why the world is so dumb. And, you know, he sort of just said as a passing comment, you know, so, someone should write a rebuttal to this or, you know, something similar to this that offers a different perspective. And, you know, I, I said to him, I was like, you know, maybe we should do it one day. And we kind of left it at that. And it was six, seven months later uh, in Austin, like I, some things had changed in my life and I had a bit of time up my sleeve and I hit him up. I said, Hey dude, let's write this book. Uh, you know, let's, let's lock ourselves in a room in an Airbnb and let's sit down and do a book sprint. And we wrote the bulk of the book in a week and we, you know, coming into, it, I wasn't sure exactly what we we're going to write. You know, like we started off kind of doing like a rebuttal you know, chapter by chapter, point by point. But then kind of the book took on its own life. So the only thing that uh, emulates from the original Communist Manifesto is like the four chapter mm -hmm. structure. Um, and, but, but other than that, like we, it's, it's its own manifesto. It lives on its own. And the, the name also came about as a joke because we weren't sure what the name it was. We were going to call it the Capitalist Manifesto, the Libertarian Manifesto, the Individualist Manifesto, the Sovereign. Like we we're throwing out these names. We're like, man, they, they all be like, they suck. So, you know, we were sitting there with um, with Mark's wife and she kind of, it was just really funny. She goes, why don't you call it the Uncommunist Manifesto? And we kind of like <laughs> looked at each other. We're like, damn, that's pretty good. So we How to uncommunist yourself, basically. It was, or... it was great. And we were like, um, okay, let's just roll with that. And um, and yeah, the, the book sort of, I'm actually very proud of it. Like it's a, it's a very easy read. It, it takes... You know, you could go sit there and spend years reading Rothbard, Mises, um, you know, Austrian economics, libertarian philosophy, like all this sort of stuff. Um, or you could, in an hour and a half, read the Uncommunist Manifesto and get basically a, a really well 
written. And I'm not just saying well written to blow smoke up my own ass, but I, I think Mark and I really did a good job of taking these complex ideas and making them simple and kind of extracting four or five like key ideas that people can walk away with that can adjust their frame of reference, the way they view the world. And, yeah. um, and I, I, I'm actually in the process of trying to get the book into Malay's hands um, for his cabinet because like he's going to have a big job of trying to re-educate the Argentine public on these principles, these ideas and something like this, like nobody's going to sit down and read a Rothbard textbook, you know, or maybe a few people will, but not, not mm. a mass amount of people, but people will read 90 minutes of a book. Um, and you know, this, this could fundamentally shift the way people think. So hopefully it becomes that kind of thing. And, um, and yeah, that, that's basically the premise of the book. We can dig into some of those points. Yeah. You awesome. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about, the concept of dynamic inequality and why it's so important in the manifesto. Yeah. So, I mean, I think equality is a scam. Um, equality of all kinds is a scam. And we'll, we'll talk about this next, which is, I think it's not only a quality of outcome, which is bad, but equality of opportunity is also stupid. Um, so, you know, what for me fundamentally uh, is important is inequality. Now, when I say inequality, I mean, variance, I mean, um, you know, I mean, diverse outcomes i mean hierarchy i mean excellence you know so all of these things which fundamentally i mean life right like show me something in life that is equal nothing like you know you look out Agree. you know i'm looking out at the ocean now the ocean is not flat and equal like there's you know waves up and down like i'm looking at the mountains like you know we as human beings we we are different you know like we we look different now you know even in a game if you have a fair game like a basketball game if the rules are fair the outcomes are going to be unequal. That's what you want. You know, you mm -hmm. want a winner and a loser, right? So, so life, anything that is living, anything that is alive, seeks inequality. That which is dead, for example, or or, or death oriented, seeks equality. Like equality mm -hmm. is a state of flatness and of death, right? Like you know, an, another good analogy to think about is that's no take, growth. Well, exactly, then... and and well, and no growth literally means death. There's no like. So, so this is what people like, this is a Tony Robbins thing that I learned many years ago. He said, like, you do not get to pick between, um, growth and no growth. You actually have to pick between growth and death. Living things are either growing or they're dying. There's no mm -hmm. like stasis yeah. point. Right. So the, the example I was going to use was you, you look at colors, right? Like red, blue, green, blah, blah, blah. Like all these different colors are unequal. They're different. If you take all the colors and want to make them equal, you mash them all together, and what do you get? Gray, right? Like so, so gray <laughs> yeah, 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 is the yeah, color yeah. of communism, right? Gray is the color of death. Like flatlining is the color of death. So, you know what you need in a functional, alive society is inequality, but it needs to be dynamic. So, mm. like you can't have static inequality, meaning, all right, I'm a central banker, I can print all the money I want, and you, uh, middle class, whatever, producer, consumer, whatever, it doesn't matter. You get robbed and we create this static inequality where you end up with a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller percentage of people who have everything and a larger and larger and larger percentage of people who have nothing, right? And that, that's a recipe for the breaking of a functional system, whereas dynamic inequality creates a robust functional system. And nature is full of dynamic inequality. All of nature is like that. Humanity... Ugh. I shouldn't say humanity. I should say the modern version of the, you know, the kind of collectivism that we've tried to create is an attempt at creating, uh, is an attempt at trying to create equality and ending up with static inequality because yeah. of how stupid that attempt is. Yeah, it's like I had to think of the word nature too. In general, it's fascinating. I, I like the quote, have you ever seen a tree stop growing? You know, it's the same thing. Like, uh, it's there's no tree that wakes up, <laughs> you know, with the sun and things. Um, just uh, today, I'm not gonna do anything, right? But yeah, so na and and where that tree seed fell, you know, on the side of a rock or a nice plain with water and and you know all the nutrients and whatever. Like that's the that's the chaos of life, right? So <laughs> when you just shared this, I also have to think of nature. But isn't the problem? more and i like what you said like it's the modern human thinking where we can like exclude ourselves from nature mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we can think or you know construct some rationale as to why we are 
outside of nature, right? I, isn't it something like that as well? That, that yeah, it's it kind is. of hubris in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I write about this a lot in the upcoming book, The Bushido of Bitcoin. I talk about what I call physiopsychology. And you know, this is a bit of a Nietzschean idea in some senses that we've tried to separate the mind from the body, right? And the, and the body is the thing that connects us to nature, right? You know, the body is this biological thing. And, and to a degree, the, the mind is either a extension of the body, um, you know, or something. But, you know, the mind is also natural, but, it, you know, it, it has this tendency to create this separation from, mm -hmm. you know, nature, the body. And, we, you know, it, it, I mean, it's even in our language, you know, mind over matter, right? It's like, no, it's mind and matter together, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. the, these things are fundamentally inextricably linked. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's just, you're spot on when you say like, we've, we've created the separation, then we wonder why uh, we are no longer connected to, you know, reality. Yeah. You know, that's the consequence. And so you also talk in a book about individual autonomy, like how does that help people or society shape different economic structures? Like why is it, is that because a lot of people are dependent right now? Yeah. So, so this one, I mean, you know, I've, I've come to believe that some people uh, just are fundamentally incapable of autonomy, <laughs> you know, like, if 2020 taught me anything is like some people are literally living, breathing NPCs. Um, you know, they, they, they can't think for themselves and like, they're just zombies. Right. But, you know, generally speaking, generally speaking, humans uh, are adaptable and we either adapt to being independent or being dependent. One of the two. Right. And like yeah. a, a great way to think about it is um, our smartphones. Right. I remember when I was young, before the smartphone, I was doing door-to-door -door sales. I was knocking on doors, and this was before we had Google Maps. Like, such a thing didn't exist. We would get given, like, we had those big street maps, like the big fat mm -hmm. books. Um, and w before going out, what we called on the field, before we'd go out and knock on doors, we'd take the street map, photocopy, and then we'd mark out what our territory was and pass it around to each salesperson. And yep. it, you, would, you would, like, learn the territory somehow like bodily wise like i could get dropped in any suburb anywhere and i just knew my way around i didn't need a map i didn't need google maps i didn't need shit these days you drop somebody in like the middle of a capital city with signs everywhere they'll be lost in five minutes without google maps without their phone they'll freak the fuck out they'll have anxiety so it's like we we, we adapt to yeah as i said dependence or independence and you know more broadly speaking we adapt to freedom or slavery now, each one comes with a cost, right? Freedom and independence is messy. Like it's, you know, it's it's not clean. It's not like it's not sterile, right? It's not a, you, know, you can't control everything, but you, it, it is a environment for growth, right? Like the, the jungle where the things grow the best is the least controlled environment, right? Whereas, you know, if you want to control and sterilize everything, sterile by definition means dead. Um, you know, you have a uh, environment of dependence, like everything is controlled um, yeah. and those environments are not conducive to life. So we, we have to pick a direction and that direction really matters, you know, in the same way as, you know, if you're looking west, if you're facing west and looking for a sunrise, it's just not going to happen, right? Like it's, it's fundamentally impossible. <laughs> so like yeah. if you want a society that grows, you have to face in the direction of, uh, growth, autonomy, independence, freedom, etc. Yeah, it's nice. I, I what I like is that also about Bitcoin to 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 link it to Bitcoin. Like I think Bitcoin really shows you that it shows you that there's an opportunity to act different in your life. Maybe take that responsibility right and be more sovereign. And the fact that it actually you, you even become aware of it, right? Because I think personally, like. I was very unaware, right? Uh, in general, I say, uh, you know, if you grow up as a millennial in a Western country, then you're probably pretty unaware of, how, you know, how else you could live your life, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's really about, you know, short-term preference or kind of like the easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life, right? Because what you say about the, the freedom, that, that means you have to fight in a sense. And if you want to be complacent you don't have to fight but then like all your self-sovereignty like everything is gone right so there's kind of this 
do you take the easy path or do you take the hard path hard path um mm -hmm. but i think in western societies in general you you are not really you're not even forced to think about that you know if you <laughs> I, I thought about that actually in the COVID times um you know here it was pretty okay but i saw pictures from india for example where people who uh, worked in cities had to go back to the rural rural areas that they came from right and there was like 50,000 people or 100,000 people at a train station waiting. And I, I read all these crazy stories about, uh, you know, siblings with their dead mother on a motorbike for 300 kilometers. I was like, damn, you know, like this, this exists currently in the world. Like they, these people have to think about these things every day, right? Because if you don't, if you are complacent, you know, that could be the end of your life in essence, right? And in, in a Western country, you could stay in bed all day and nothing happens basically right so you're not you're not forced to think about it mm -hmm. you adapt you adapt to your environment yeah. that's what humans are we're adapt we're, we're adaptation machines and so how can you get to a point where you see that other option is that only when you have a problem yeah i mean the, I, I think there has to be a catalyst uh, and you know each of us I mean, life's not smooth for anybody, right? We, we've all got some sort of challenge, some sort of problem, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you know in, in, in some way, shape, or form, life is going to throw you a curveball. Uh, it's going to challenge you. And it's what you do. It's, it's, you know, it's a classic personal development kind of thing, right? It's, um, it's not what happens to you. It's what you do with it that matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can be a victim or a victor. Uh, and you can take ownership, take responsibility once again of uh, of situation, and uh, you know then do something with it. So you know fu fundamentally speaking, like we we live in a world absent uh, responsibility. I've, I wrote an article a couple of years ago called "Responsibility Go Up Technology." Right. So everyone talks about NGU, and I said, well, look, you know that's cool and all, and it's important, gets people in, but you know you come for the NGU, you stay for the RGU the responsibility go up. And, mm. you know, I kind of framed Bitcoin as, you know, it's most important thing is it's not freedom money, which I mean, it is freedom money, but that's not as important. What's more important is that it's responsibility money or responsible money. And, you know, I, I've, I've said this many times is Bitcoin's most important impact on civilization is not that it's going to help the weak and bank the unbank. No, no, no. It's going to relocalize economic consequence. That is more important than anything else and and not even just a little bit more important like i'm talking fucking orders of magnet it's the 99 percent of bitcoin's importance is the relocalization of economic consequence every other benefit is the one percent doesn't fucking matter like in in you mean in the distributing it across the layers again so yeah i mean I, from the bottom layer back back up what, what, what do you mean by that as in the the um, you said economic localizing economic consequence yeah exactly so do you mean that in a geographical way i was thinking more about the consequence of the four cantillionaires to abuse you know how money is not there on that low on that level that's kind of yeah no what, what where i, I mean, went okay, yeah. what, what i mean specifically is localizing economic consequence meaning that um when an individual makes a decision inside an economy. So an economy is just made up of a bunch of uh, actors, agents mm -hmm. acting. Um, their actions uh, have an economic consequence and that economic consequence should be paid by the actor, not by mm. other actors. So gotcha. that's essentially yeah. what I mean. So the world we live in at the moment has zero localization of economic consequence. Someone can go and print money and the consequence is distributed amongst everybody. So in other words, like if I'm a central banker, I can play the game of, I'll jump off a cliff and instead of me dying, Bram dies. Yeah. And then I jump off a cliff again and then somebody else dies. Yeah. So what does that teach me? I can jump off as many cliffs as I want and somebody mm -hmm. else fucking dies. So somebody else is always paying the bill. Bitcoin will ensure that the, the that consequence localizes. Now, it's not going to be perfect because it's impossible to get perfection. But the more that localizes, the more you get two effects. You get positive reinforcement for good behavior and you get negative reinforcement for bad behavior. That simultaneously creates a corrective mechanism in society, in civilization, so that the good is kept and the bad is either corrected or removed. 
that is so important for a functional system. And that's what Bitcoin does to the, to the, to the world. Like if you like, I'll give you an analogy. If you lost the pain receptors in your hand, you could put your hand in the fire and you could literally burn off your hand and you wouldn't even fucking know. Mm. And that's the world that we're living in at the moment. We are eroding our capital base. We're eroding out the civilization that we have. And we don't even know because we just keep printing money and we cover up the losses. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what Bitcoin does. It makes, it makes losses real again. And that's so important. I find it so fascinating that it's not like that, right? I mean, it sounds so simple. And at the same time, I think like, why, why is it not like that, right? But it is maybe also because of the human nature that we kind of just touched upon, right? Like if, yeah, we've if I don't have to away. think about it, then yeah, yeah why would I uh, question it, right? Uh, you, and especially if it just works for me and I still don't have to think about it, right? I mean, yeah, so it, it makes sense. when. Or how, um, how how do we achieve a more like m more more of something that's really a meritocracy? Then, I mean, like Bitcoin plays a big factor in that, right? So, like, you know, we we can have a social revolution, right? We can have a political revolution. We can do all this sorts of stuff, um, and you know, this has happened many many times uh, throughout history, right? We we've had the the debauchery of the currency and you know that goes hand in hand like you know pe people say the root of all of the problems is the money printing and i i disagree with that i think the root of all the problems starts culturally upstream that's where the, mm. that's where the cancer starts and honestly it's the it's the introduction of concepts such of such as uh, equality and democracy, right? As soon as we start to make things average, we move our gaze from ascendance and excellence to average. And average is the first step towards death. This is uh, Breedlove and I were discussing this. So, so that directionality is really important. Now, that leads us to inevitably printing money, and then printing money just accelerates the yeah. the destabilization and the the um the debasement of civilization, right? So. What ends up happening is civilization falls apart. We have a revolution. We restart things. We're like, okay, no, we've got to do things better. We've got to do things different. And here we go yeah. again, right? And we, we, we enter a new cycle. Now, Bitcoin specifically might you know, save us from having to repeat these cycles over and over again because it makes it so that acceleration point never happens. Um, and we, you know, we, we are in a position where it makes like there is a better reward for better behavior and there is a consequence for poor behavior. And once you, you know, establish that or create that in a society, you have some corrective mechanisms. So, you know, Bitcoin fundamentally is like a really key important part, but add to that. And this is, this is what my book is about. You know, the Bushido of Bitcoin is what are the virtues? What are the principles that we must embody that we must inculcate in ourselves in ourselves first, it's very important, so that it becomes a part of our culture, so that we have a strong culture that actually excels on a Bitcoin standard. So, so the way you can sort of think about the Bushido is like, okay, we have a rule book in the current world. The rule book today is get into banking, get into fucking tech, VC, like figure out a way to get into politics, central banking, whatever. Find a way to lie, cheat, steal, be cunning, whatever, right? Now, not everybody does that, but a large amount of people do that. Or it tells you, you know, the rule book is be a fucking consumer, just buy shit, you know, or, mm. you know, invest, 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 right? Like, so or we, 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 you know, the, rule, the, the modern playbook is a playbook of stupidity, right? The Bitcoin playbook, you know, to, to get ahead on a Bitcoin standard, I believe you're going to need to have principles like justice, like courage, like loyalty, respect, excellence, responsibility. Um, compassion, like so. So the whole point of the book is, I said, okay, what are the principles and virtues we need to establish and develop yeah. in ourselves as individuals? So that I believe is, you know, the the sort of the two pronged approach is Bitcoin fundamentally fix the economics and you you fix the framework for the world, but then it's within that framework how do you excel? And that is by establishing a culture of uh, made up of individuals who have. Uh, a strong set of virtues and then the question is what are those virtues and that was the exact point of the damn book is let's identify what these are let's look at where they were successful throughout history and what we can do to bring them forward um 
you know, onto a Bitcoin standard. Yeah. So that's really how we apply. I kind of see it like this, where if Bitcoin is the base layer of truth, right? In that sense, I I see Bitcoin as like engineered truth. If if that's always just the truth on which we build, then you are basically talking about how we apply Bitcoin as a tool or how we use Bitcoin as a tool to to build that Bitcoin-enabled new society, basically. Like how do we apply the tool of Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin does force us in a sense mm -hmm. to implement this um, kind of reward and punishment system, as you said, right? You can only... Um, um, uh, profit, uh, quote unquote, from Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin can only give you value when when you follow the, the base set of rules that everyone can see, right? And if you try to mess with the rules, then you won't get anything out of it, basically, right? So that 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 incentive is already built in. But you talk about okay, how do we actually integrate that and then build together? Yes, to a, to a degree. If I was to rephrase it, I would say like um, you, you're 100% on the right track. There's these principles that make Bitcoin special. And then how do we take those principles and use Bitcoin to then establish a better society? Yeah, I, I would say we will succeed when we've forgotten all about Bitcoin. So when Bitcoin kind of dissolves into the background and nobody mm -hmm. like you and me are not writing Bitcoin books anymore, not doing podcasts, nobody gives a fuck because, you know, like do, do you see people today doing a podcast on the internet? No, mm -hmm. like it's just the internet, right? Like we'll use it. So when when we stop talking about Bitcoin, that's when we know it will have succeeded because it becomes this framework. And then it's less about using Bitcoin. It's more about, um, as I said, cultural principles yeah. um, that operate best on the framework yeah. that Bitcoin establishes, the socioeconomic framework. Would you define that as some sort of age of enlightenment in a sense then? Yeah, you could call it that. Um, you know, I, I think it's a it's definitely a new age. I mean, this is where we can tie it to some of the stuff that I've written about Nietzsche, right? So Nietzsche, you know, 150 years ago predicted, he said, uh, you know, and, and he did this at a time when the Western civilization was at its peak. Like, you know, you had Germany, like, you know, Wagner, like, you know, Europe was winning big time, right? Like it was the peak of civilization. He said, uh, you know, while you idiots are all partying, um, I am telling you that civilization is going to fall apart. People are like, you're fucking crazy. What are you talking about? Um, and his whole point was we are letting in these ideas of equalitarianism, of average, of, you know, democratic thinking. We are, we are shifting our gaze from excellence. And what's going to happen? And he said it's going to take many, many generations. It's going to take 100, 200 years. But we're going to enter the age of what he called the last man. And, you know, millennials, you know, today we might understand this last man concept as the NPC or the lemming, right, or the masses. Um, and he yeah. said, you know, you know we're going to enter this age of this, this cynical person who wants to just tear down everything that's beautiful and turn it all into rubble. But he said also from that age, from that time, a new archetype of person will rise. And he called it the ubermensch, you know, the overman. And, you know, I write about this in my latest piece on the Bitcoin Times. I call it uber money. And I, I say that, you know, what... Nietzsche was essentially missing was this 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 framework of excellence, which is a praxeological framework, which is a monetary network, which is Bitcoin, enables, establishes a framework for that kind of an age to rise up. But that age will only rise up from an age of complete shamelessness and debauchery and stupidity. So, so we're kind of at that point. Now, I don't know how bad clown world is going to get it's probably going to get worse <laughs> before it gets better even but, worse yeah. yeah i mean i'm sure it's going to get worse but from that will rise what you're kind of thinking of this age of enlightenment or the age of um you know the the, the early stages of the ubermensch the age of the ubermensch so the ubermensch needs this uber money i also saw you talk about bitcoin as energy money but it's mm -hmm. kind of you, you you combine these nietzsche ideas and bitcoin can you share a bit about that like how do you end up with uber money or yeah energy so, money so, i mean energy money if anyone's ever listened to your stuff sailor stuff whatever they'll sort of understand right but bitcoin is con conservatively sound right you can't print more of it you can't create more of it it's you know it's fixed in supply blah blah, blah which what, what it mimics is essentially energy you can't create mm. energy you can't destroy it all you can do is transform it and you know transmit it right you can harvest it harness it but you're not creating anything. So, so Bitcoin kind of shares that relationship. And, you know, physicists call 
uh, energy the currency of the universe because in many ways everything is made up of that. So, you know, Bitcoin is a currency, right? Like that's what it does. And it, you know, allows you to transmit um, time and energy over space and all this sort of stuff that, you know, we've heard Sailor talk about millions of times. The the point here is that, um, you know, it, it's not to to say literally speaking that Bitcoin is energy money, but metaphorically that is a powerful metaphor and it, and it yep. works. So I then relate that to this idea of Uber money, which is, okay, if you have an energetically uh, or conservative money, something that you can't corrupt, then you have that framework. Like I, I said this on a recent podcast, I said, if reality could be defined as that which is irreversible, then Bitcoin is the realest money we've ever had because Bitcoin is yeah. irreversible, right? And um, that kind of a framework establishes uh, a need for excellence. And excellence is the pathway to the Ubermensch, like excellence over generations. You have to breed the Ubermensch. That, like gives, that, you an anchor, that gives you an anchor point in the future, right? Like that's what I meant with engineered truth. I think we say the same, right? It's irreversible. So it just is in a sense, like time is, right? And we can prove that it is because, you know, we have all the validators and all the code. It said like, it's, it's so transparent that you can prove that it just is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, once you accept that, then you can set an anchor point in the future because you know that what you are operating on is truth in a sense. And so you can head towards that direction. Does that does that make sense? Like that's kind of how I uh, created in, in in my mind there. Yeah, you you can use it as a as a as a magnet or a catalyst. Either way, right? So mm. so a catalyst pushes it, or a magnet attracts. You know, and it, it's you know it's some mix of the of both. Yeah, and so you talk about these ideas in this new edition of the Bitcoin Times. I think I said it correctly. It's a limited once a year. Yeah, magazine, you nailed it. Right, yeah, you nailed it. It's yes. the sixth uh, sixth edition. Yes. Why do you focus on energy now? What's what's the yeah the relationship between Bitcoin and energy? I think you just mentioned it. Why now about energy? Yeah, so I mean, the each year is a different theme, right? So last the uh, sorry, not last year, but the year before, we did the Austrian edition. Um, you know, the one before that was kind of like a futuristic edition called the New Hope. Um, the one before that was the Promethean edition. The one before that was the Sovereignty and sorry, Sovereignty edition. So, like, each one has a theme. And last year there was just this growing noise around like energy, FUD, climate catastrophists. The world's gonna fucking end. We're gonna boil the oceans. You know, everything's gonna die. Like, you know, we're, we're boiling in Europe at thirty six degrees. I was like, bro. I grew up in Australia, like normal summer day was 45. None of us boiled. Okay, well, and when I was younger, 36 degrees or 32 was like a yellow on the map. And now yeah. it was like a super dark red, which yeah, is exactly. fascinating We're all gonna to die. see. Yeah. So, you know, I just got sick of all that garbage. And I was like, man, you know, let's, let's do the energy edition. Let's, um, let's write about this. And there's six obviously fantastic writers in there. Parker Lewis did the foreword. Andrew Myers, who's doing incredible work with a company called Satoshi Energy, he's like linking up large scale energy producers with um, with the Lightning Network and enabling them to price their energy in real time in sets. Um, there's Gideon Powell, who comes from a oil and gas background. His dad was one of the early um, wildcatters out of Texas. So he writes this incredible piece on human ingenuity. And like he, he quotes this guy called Julian Simon, who has a fascinating economic take, which he says, there's no such thing as finite resources. So the only thing that's finite is uh, human ingenuity. So like mm. we're, we're not running out of molecules. We're not running out of atoms. Like, you know, th th there's an infinite amount of those. What we're running out of is ideas and capacity to be ingenious, right? So like that's the only limiting factor. We're, we're never going to run out of oil molecules. They're all, they're all there. Carbon atoms are all there. So it's our, our capacity to extract that. So he does a piece um uh, Brian Gitt, uh, who's a, he's kind of like of the Alex Epstein sort of uh, crowd. He did a fantastic piece on nuclear and how that can solve uh, a bunch of problems for modern computing. 
Um, there was Drew Armstrong who did a really deep piece, like if people like stuff from like Gigi and, you know, really deep thinking about physics and like the nature of existence, he did one called On Entropy. And then, yeah, I did a piece that kind of explores this relationship between energy, Bitcoin, excellence and Nietzsche's ideas. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite philosophical, you know, it'll get people fired up, but yeah, it's a, it's a different, um, different angle. So we, we do this once a year. The, these essays are purely published for the Bitcoin Times. Um, people can buy it as a collectible if they want. They can read the essays online for free on our Substack. Um, and this year, I'm also going to launch an Amazon paperback edition. So that way it's cheap. Like, cause the mm, collectible, fun. the collectible is expensive. Like it's about a hundred bucks a pop, um, hundred bucks a copy, but it's like, it's, it's priced in sets and there's only 2100 printed and they've got a code on the back. So like, I actually, for people listening, I'll show them uh, one. So I obviously have uh, number one of 2100. Nice. So, and, cool. you know, the, the set. So that's, uh, this is addition. So that's three. This is four. So that's one yeah, of 2100. Fun. So, yeah, people can pick that up or, you know, the, the Amazon edition when it comes out. But, yeah, the idea is like timeless, beautiful content that will – inspire people make them think and um and give them what they need to understand about bitcoin yeah and i think you just touched upon it the the subject of abundance of energy and and why it's so important is that what you mentioned with regards to yeah we have all these we have all these building blocks in essence there's no finite supply now, now that we're talking about something like is is just the idea of there's finite resources, and thus it's all going very bad. Is isn't that just like a prime example of like the the downward thinking that you yeah, it really is. that you mentioned exactly. before, right? Yeah. It, it's like oh my god, I I cannot do anything. I yeah. uh, someone else has to do something, or the earth has to change whatever it's doing, and then I'm saved, right? Yeah, it, this is kind of the the apathy. Yeah, it's the it's the victim. It's the victim, and apathy is a great word. Like it is the apathetic victim mindset that is like, you know, that that is the cancer that is destroying the world. Like the 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 cancer of the world is not fucking climate change. The cancer of the world is, uh, you know, this brain dead idea that we are powerless to do anything about it. Not yeah. the case again could stem from the fact that if we place ourselves outside of nature then obviously we would end up at this place yeah i mean you know we we do need to understand like there's there's a link to nature but we are i think in many ways the apex uh, Mm -hmm. manifestation of nature so we need to remember that too so so there's some people who are like oh you know nature is everything and you know like humans are insignificant right No, we are significant. We are definitely like, we are both a part of nature, but like, if you think about it like this, it's like life, you know, so, so you've got energy, then life is kind of the, um, you know, the hand reaching out. Um, and you know, human beings are like the fingertips. Like we, we are the very, Mm. we are the very tip of life. We are, we are the, the, the highest, most complex, most, you know, sophisticated manifestation of life which itself is the highest, most ordered, uh, sophisticated manifestation of energy. And, mm-hmm. you know, energy is the thing, it's the substance, right, that that, that animates everything. So, like, we, we need to recognize that and, um, you know, we need to live with that. So that doesn't mean we disconnect ourselves from nature. We, we are a part of it. But we, we need to understand that we are creators. We build, we produce, we create. And, yeah. you know, we, we you know, if... I mean, if you take a loser's mentality, don't don't be surprised that you fucking lose, right? <laughs> like, so you yeah, need to. I agree. Yeah. One plus one equals two. You know. Yeah. And you just uh, you just mentioned like the ingenuity. How how does human ingenuity play in the context of of Bitcoin and energy? I mean, there are so many examples already of people, you know, capturing methane and um, optimizing grids and all these things. Like, what are what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, it's in, it's incredible. Like you know, like just just the things that human beings can come up with, like both stupid and intelligent, is like beyond um, 
you know, you, you, you'll never be able to put a cap on it, right? Like that's human ingenuity. We, we come up with things. Um, AI can never do that. Like we are, we are fundamentally creators, creative, um, and the things we'll come up with, the, the gaps will close, um, uh, are fascinating. And as you said, like down to things like, okay, there's, we flare gas. So let's put a Bitcoin. I mean, actually one interesting one that I saw a little while ago was this spa in New York. They, mm. you know, they have heated pools. So what they've done is they've got these, uh, you know, miners that are immersed in liquid and that liquid heats the water. And then, you know, they run the spa, the, the, the heated pools and the heated water in the spa comes from the miners. Brilliant. Absolutely fucking brilliant. Like yeah. I, I looked at that. I was like, damn, I want to do that. I literally want to build that in my own house so that I have a hot tub and it's powered by miners. Like brilliant. Most of all, it's just really cool. But yeah, it's it's yeah. it's funny how uh, how stupid and brilliance is. Um, have you ever read the Kubalion? You know that, like about the Hermetic principles, like as above, so below, as below, so above. Like the like it's about these universal principles. But they say like uh, like there's a law of polarity as well, and it's okay. like like brilliance and stupidity is not it's the same thing it's just a different intensity of the same thing right yeah, like hot and cold totally. yeah. or yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or light and dark right and yeah. uh well sometimes also really stupid and simple ideas actually are pretty brilliant right yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like excitement anxiety right it's like a, it's like exactly a, they're, yeah. they're, they're shades of each other right exactly um, yeah yeah a oh, shade that's a that's yeah. that's a better word yeah 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 um and so do you also talk about like the environmental concerns or at least what what people talk about yeah, when they talk Marty, about bitcoin yeah marty bent did a whole piece on that i forgot to mention him actually so he he did a piece on that where he basically debunks the whole um esg narrative and all that sort of stuff it's fantastic and he uses germany as a great example of you know of a country who on paper has increased their energy capacity um you know with all of the renewable energy crap that they're doing um but in reality um they actually haven't uh that they, they've i think their on paper energy capacity is double or triple what it used to be like 20 years ago but the real uh difference in um energy use is only up two percent which means like that's the maximum they can actually use out of it so it's like it just shows like the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the the lie and his whole essay is built around this idea of it's time to come back to reality like we've just been lying to ourselves and if we continue lying to ourselves, something's going to break and it's going to be catastrophic. Yeah. And so if we talk about the uh, Uncommunist Manifesto and, and Bitcoin and we talked about meritocracy, I, I also wanted to ask you if, if there's an ideal society and there is a meritocracy and we have this dynamic inequality, is then capitalism the system? Or like how, how do you view that? Is, is, is that the most fair type of system then you could use or is, is there something else pretty much like i think you can so in the book we boil down capitalism to not a political modality but a, um, a natural process right so if you look at if you define what capital is capital is things and stuff right so there's there's kind of three forms of primary capital you can call it time energy natural resources right and you know what we do as human beings uh, as as a living species is we take these building blocks and we try to use them as efficiently and as effectively as possible so mm -hmm. that is by definition the process of capitalism right like is you take your capital and you use it as efficiently as effectively as possible that's just fucking normal like right you know that's not a political thing it's nothing fancy it's just like all living things are performing this natural process of capitalism. Thinking about a squirrel and and like him collecting all the food for the winter. It's basically Seriously. that. Yeah, yeah he's, no. do, he's doing capitalism, right? So yeah, so yeah. so that's so that's like the process of capitalism, right? Doing stuff hmm. with capital. Then you have the political thing, right? And the political, like you know, if we know that capitalism as a process works, using things and stuff, energy, resources, time as efficiently and effectively as possible then it would make sense to build some sort of political model, you know, or political process or political format or structure or governance system, whatever you want to call it, that as closely as possible either emulates or enables that natural capitalist process to occur. And if you want to call that political system capitalism, sure, that's fine. You know, we can mm -hmm. call it capitalism the process, capitalism the politics, right? Um, 
that's fine. You know, I don't think we can ever build a political model ju- that is purely capitalistic as so as 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 close as possible to the process, right? Because by you know, when you build a you know a social process, you by definition have a layer on it. It's kind of like the map and the territory, right? The map will mm. never one hundred percent represent the territory, but it can get close. So yep. what you want to do from a political governance standpoint is you want to build something that as closely as possible resembles uh, the capitalistic process. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin goes a long way to this. And let's tie it back to what we discussed earlier is Bitcoin is the realest money because you can't reverse it. You can't, you know, so, so it localizes economic consequence. So therefore, you have a system where you are fundamentally incentivized to use your capital, Bitcoin, as efficiently and effectively as possible. So, yeah. so it kind of that ties everything That's a good together. Loop, yeah. Yeah, and also to earn it or play a part of allocating that capital, you are incentivized to not be a tourist, right? As a lot of people are tourists in jobs or you know stuff like that. So you have to add value yeah. to create value to capture value or yeah. something like that, right? Like you, yeah, it's forced. It's a forced incentive in a in in, in a sense. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So how do you see? If we combine these things like on communists, we're talking about energy. Like, how do you see the future for Bitcoin and and the application in in the world? I mean, it's very bright. Like, it's going to continue on. Like, I I wrote a. In fact, I'll I'll see if I can find the passage here quickly. That uh, I was just I was, I was writing a section for the the Bit, the Bushido of Bitcoin, which kind of just basically summarizes why people should have Bitcoin. So I'll just read it. I said, all that being said, um, don't be stupid. Betting against Bitcoin is quite possibly the dumbest social and economic decision you could possibly make. Doubly so if you have agreed with the rest of this book and want to work towards A, making the world a better, more beautiful, ascendant place, and B, if you want to have a lineage that lives on to benefit from that world. Uh, Ignoring it uh, is not far behind. So if you do not hold Bitcoin, and when I say hold, I mean actually hold it, not some ETF or instrument, you should change that now. So like, you know, my my message there is basically like, you know, don't be stupid, quit ignoring it. Um, You know, Bitcoin is going to continue to grow. It's not just a technology that, you know, these MySpace idiots say, it's like, oh yeah, Bitcoin's all technology. No, Bitcoin is a socioeconomic, technological socioeconomic phenomenon. It's gonna. It's it's all of these things combined. Like it, creating a new money takes centuries, mm. naturally speaking. And so Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoin's gonna compress that in a short period of time. And you know, if you're sleeping because on it, because it's technology, basically. Well, be, because we live in a digital and technological world, and because yeah. it it interfaces so well with that, right? And you know, that just means it's going to. It's going to grow at a much faster rate because it's not a physical object, but it has a relationship to the physical world through energy. So it's like this beautiful, like elegant blend of all of these things. And yeah, to, to sort of sum up that line of thought and to finish this up, it's, you know, sleeping on Bitcoin and ignoring it um, or betting against it. They're, they're all just dumb decisions. So don't be stupid. Get some Bitcoin, yeah. learn about it and, you know, make your life better. I heard American Hoddle, uh, there was a video of him where he talks about, you know, adopting Bitcoin is self-love, right? And basically <laughs> what you really just is. said, like, if you if you ignore it, it's ba- you, you basically hate yourself. And I, it's so funny when I hear myself say these things, right? Like, if I think about, like, five years ago, I was already into Bitcoin and never thought, like, oh, these are really things I'm going to say and believe. But, like, I'm there, you know? <laughs> like, it's so funny. But I, in general, I think that's what... Bitcoin makes you do like once you see it, it's really you cannot unsee it, and and you are also you feel incentivized. I think that's the best. That's that's a good word to also do the contribution, right? Like that's why I started the podcast. That's why you're writing. It's it's a mutually beneficial game instead of a, a zero sum exercise with you know some rando people that you don't even like. <laughs> you know, it feel it's way more than technology. I love that you said that. Yeah, awesome, man. Um, well then. I'd love to wrap up with my last question that I ask everyone. And that's what's a core belief that you will never let go? <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, no, because I have many. <laughs> that's why. All um, right. <laughs> uh, I think uh, 
the okay let's let's just pepper this one in um i think the opposite to uh communism is beauty um and i think this is poorly understood but uh you know beauty is ascendant um beauty is the ultimate low time preference pursuit um it takes time effort energy sacrifice uh courage duty loyalty respect justice all of these the all of the greatest virtues combined uh required in order to build produce create something beautiful and um and i think it's uh it's the highest pursuit um you know it's it's right up there with you know the concept of you know the ineffable or god right like so so beauty for me is the opposite of communism because communism represents everything that is ugly um everything that is death dying and decaying so yeah i encourage people to think deeply about that one because you know most people tell you the opposite of communism is capitalism which you know it is um but you know fundamentally speaking the 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 thing that the thread that runs through that is beauty yeah love that man i think that's a great ender um i'll make sure to link to your social your website uh, we didn't even talk about spirit of satoshi maybe next time but next i think time. that's a very very cool experiment so uh we definitely uh, encourage people to to check that out and uh yeah thanks so much for coming on man thank you my friend really appreciate it cheers i hope you enjoyed this episode if you did it would be amazing if you could rate review and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice it will help us educate more millennials on the importance of bitcoin you can follow and connect with me on twitter i'm bramke that's at b-r-a-m-k and if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on bitcoin that's worth sharing hit me up i read and reply to every single message i appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode thanks for listening bye